This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about two films by director <gasps> Hermano Olmi. First up, Il Posto from 1961. Mm-hmm. Synopsis from Letterboxd. With his family mired in financial troubles, Domenico comes to Milan, Italy from his small town to get a job in lieu of furthering his education. A lack of options forces him to take a position as a messenger at a big company where he hopes to receive a promotion soon. There, Domenico meets Antoinetta, a young woman in a similar situation as himself. The two form a tentative relationship, but the soulless nature of their jobs threatens to keep them apart. So, RJ, this week... Uh, Yes. um, This has fallen, you know... Right here, deep in the heart of Creeptober. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past, these uh, these poor criterions wandering into the dark, mean streets, pumpkin mm-hmm. filled. Uh, they, they they sometimes don't have a chance because mm-hmm. these movies they're cutting into ghoul times. They are a hundred percent cutting into those ghoul times, and dare I say, sometimes, Jared. This has uh, biased our opinion a little bit. I think so, yes. So I mean, maybe not yours, but mine for sure. So this week, what do we got? We got ourselves some Italian neorealism here in Creeptober. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. Finally. <laughs> Finally. Well, we've had some before. Mm-hmm. And here we are again. So, uh, But mm-hmm. we've never seen a movie by this Hermano Olmi, uh, a man who I believe I would have maybe noted died last year in March or something like that because one mm. of his, one of his uh, I think his, the, the next film of his that we're talking about does not come for a very very long time but has this uh, maybe even memorable title we'll see if you remember it do you remember me telling you of the forthcoming DVD Blu-ray The Tree of Wooden Clogs Did you... uh, I, I, I don't but I would have if I had to guess my response was probably that's not real <laughs> But it, it sounds made up. But it is real. And it did come out. It's been out for a while now. But uh, yeah, okay. that's, so we will not be seeing Mr. Olmi again for a very long time. So, and here we yeah. are with two of his films. So, this Il Posto. Uh, the movie hits you with uh, the drudgery of life. <laughs> How so? <laughs> it's, uh, so this starts off with this kid. It's yeah. this like p- puffy haired kid. And he's mm-hmm. in bed. And he's very morose, kind of sad. Mm-hmm. It's like one of those great shots of like where you can't even see his body. He's just like a head, like a decapitated mm-hmm. head inside of the sheets on a pillow. And mm-hmm. uh, it's like early in the morning. His parents are rousing him up saying, get up. And your younger brother is like, where, where's your younger brother? Where is he at? You got to eat. You got to eat for your interview. And mm-hmm. he's like, oh, I don't want to go. And I was like, kind of at this point, I was like, okay, well. Nothing interesting is happening yet, so let's let's see where this goes. Mm-hmm. We'll wait it out. We'll wait it out. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we get things start. I mean, what I actually did, and uh, maybe this made a big difference, is I at this point went to Wikipedia and went, "What is this movie going to be about?" Because I have no mm-hmm. idea. I like to try and go in blind, but sometimes I'm like, "I better, I better have some context." So I skimmed, <laughs> I skimmed it, I skimmed the plot, and I went, "Okay." Mm-hmm. So that's what this is going to be. So I start watching it and then I get to the job interview stuff. Like when you actually mm-hmm. go and you, cause they don't really lay it out too much. It's kind of just like letting the moments kind of just, uh, unfurl in front of the mm-hmm. camera. It's very natural. Um, yep. long takes, uh, these are non-professional actors and. Oh, really? Yeah. So they're just, they're just guys that were cast because they looked the parts cool. in, in, in real locations, not sets. Mm-hmm. So as this starts getting into like the. I guess the thesis of the movie, I start getting drawn in RJ I, 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 somehow. Oh. I, I was kind of like, oh, hey, what's this movie about? Because I also saw that people that I follow on Letterboxd that have seen it, they're pretty high on this. Mm-hmm. And after the first 10 minutes, I was like, oh boy, is this going to be one of those types of movies again? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but no, as this movie starts getting going, I'm like getting uh-huh. more and more like, ooh, I like the, what is this? This social critique of of mm-hmm. of of our systems and our lives. And mm-hmm. my God, this is 1961. I don't know when this actually begins, but like you started mm-hmm. like oh, these like all these people they're rounded up into a room, and mm-hmm. you again you're still not sure what's happening. You're like, is he going in for like a doctor's appointment? <laughs> and there's like this like woman comes out with her very young son. Like he looks like mm-hmm. he's like. 
13, but I mean, people are pulling mm-hmm. their, apparently in, in this uh, post-war Europe, Italy, people are pulling their kids out of school because we're not making ends meet at home. Dad's got a bad back. We better send the, send the boy off to work and get some of that, uh, that cheddar so we mm-hmm. can get that pasta on the table. And uh, what kind of pasta, Jared? Uh, my preference of some fettuccine, or, or what about some gabagool? Or some gabagool, indeed. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we, we, all these people are crammed together, all wearing trench coats. They have this mm-hmm. air of desperation because you realize like, this is a job interview, and these <laughs> people are all vying for probably a limited number of jobs. And you hear people mm-hmm. whispering, they're like, Oh, yeah, no, that person's definitely. They, I can't even play for it. Why are we even doing here? And you're just like, oh, okay. And then they get taken through this elaborate, like, procession through mm-hmm. these, like, massive buildings, these huge structures bigger than ourselves. And, like, they're just being marched along. And I'm just, like, starting imagining this, like, completely different movie where it's, like, mm-hmm. it, this could be the entire job interview. This entire movie is just, like, people being marched through, like, a bunwell like movie. And, like, mm-hmm. people get, like, they get lost because they get kind of sidetracked by things where you're, like, oh, mm-hmm. what's this over here? And then they're, like, where did the rest of the group go? And then the rest of the group keeps going and going and going. And then you leave the building. And then you go out into the streets. And then you leave the city altogether. But it's all part of the interview. It's not that type of movie. But this mm-hmm. started, like, I don't know. It's stimulating my mind. Um, and then they get brought to this room this uh room of desks and they're made to write an exam and it's like they give they're given a math question that is pretty simple and they're like and and they're told and they're told they have an hour yes i was also a little bit blown back by that this is (laughs) i was fascinated by this because i'm like then they're not given an hour and then Mm -hmm. i went is this like a weird translation problem like the subtitle is wrong because mm-hmm. it seemed like they were given a few minutes to do this for essentially what is a two-part math problem. Yep. And I mean, but I get it. It's like, okay, because the guy even tells us, the person giving the test, it's very simple. But then people are like really stressing about it because I think they're stressing about it because it's too easy. And mm-hmm. and then there's this one guy, he seems to have a real problem getting it. Like he really doesn't know what he's doing. He's either blanked out or he doesn't know. And then it's when it's called it, test anxiety, Jarrett. And then when the people start coming through and they start collecting the tests and they're, Oh, excuse me, sir, you have to give him your test. This poor man, he's just like, no. And he's like refusing to give it up. And then they, it's okay if you didn't finish it. It's okay, but it's not okay, RJ. And everybody in the room knows it and they take it away. And then the camera pans back and looks over the faces of the other people taking the test. And they've all turned around to watch this scene. And you feel the shame. The shame that (laughs) that I think, I don't know, you're just like, oh. But they're all like kind of silent. But they're also gleeful that I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. You've been there probably, right? (sighs) On either end. And then the movie kind of takes a a break from this Mm -hmm. process. Then we get what's called, I guess, the meat cute between our uh, protagonist Dominico and uh, Antoinetta, mm-hmm. they they go for uh, the communal cafe lunch, which consists of yeah. spaghetti, a big old plate of spaghetti, spaghetti, spaghetti. Okay. Um, and then he's he's like he's like you know you're looking around, and you're like oh hey, there's like an attractive girl, maybe I'll talk to her. And then, mm-hmm. but in fact, they hit it off in a casual huh. way. And then they start hanging out. They go for a walk. They're chatting. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he buys her a coffee, his treat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then one of my notes here was like, what what's up with these little coffees? These little coffee cups. I mean. Espressos? Yeah, are, are they espressos or are they just coffees? And they're, just, they're, they're like, this is the Italian way. Little little coffees. It's Hard like, to say. I mean, I, when I see people walking around, they've got like big gulps filled mm. with coffee in it because there's no uh, stopping North American excess, perhaps. <laughs> or just, you can't have enough. Yeah. Give me the pot and just pour it straight into me. Um, are, are, I mean, are you that kind of coffees, man? I, I, I mean, I drink a pot every day, but I like I have a French press and I, I drink it, the whole thing, so I don't know how much that is. I don't think it's excessive, but I, I, I do know sometimes you get that like those guys who have that Slurpee cup that's like the big mug, like the big red one that holds like four fucking liters. It's just full of coffee. And it's like, geez, geez. Where do you fill that bad boy up? Uh, anywhere there's a toilet, pretty much. Whoa. So uh-huh. So we get this mute cute. 
they they rush back. He gets admonished for walking on some grass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they continue on with these ridiculous physical tests, doing squats. And uh, mm-hmm. you're just like, what does this have to do with jobs? <laughs> what doesn't it? Don't, don't you have to squat on a daily basis at your job? No. Maybe you're but not the, but doing they, it right. But they would come in handy. Yeah, 100% no. those would come in handy. So the the job interview ends. He goes mm-hmm. back home. It's mm-hmm. uh, kind of like, oh, well, yeah, that was, I guess we'll see what happens. But he gets that call back because we know because his mom takes him clothes shopping. And he's got his mm-hmm. eye on this really nice, like, a, I'm putting in quotes, nice uh, <laughs> rain jacket, overcoat. But his mom's buying him the cheaper alternative. But they, they all look just the same to me. They all just look like the same bland thing because you got style low jerry you know know. one's got a slightly different cut of the collar i guess i Mm -hmm. i I didn't get a get a sense of it it's all black and white these films um and so yeah then you get to the next step who got hired in this mass hiring and uh one by one people enter the door you sit down you find out the the people amongst you you were among the anointed Mm -hmm. and then there's some awkward whispering oh yeah I guess we got the job. Yeah, we got the job. I, I'm not surprised he got the job. Oh, he got the job too. That kind of surprises me. Uh, <laughs> and then you get another procession, uh, a ceremony, you know, um, a graduation, kind, right? a, a graduation from like sure. being on the outside of a job for like, mm-hmm. like these are like municipal jobs or a big corporate. Like, it's kind of like metal. It doesn't even matter what the job is because at the mm-hmm. end of the day, RJ, it's going to be heartless, soulless, soul crushing. You get marched through these grand spaces that make you smaller than ever. You're just like mm-hmm. little little pieces of this system being marched through. And then you get uh, put into your position uh, by uh, Ill, into ill-appointed offices of shabby carpets, weird furnishings. Mm. There's men behind glasses and desks that kind of mm-hmm. grumblingly tell you what you're going to be doing. And uh, that's just the way it's going to be. There's the the clattering of footsteps coming down hallways. This is all just speaking to my heart, RJ. This is the how this come, is, Jer? I, I don't know. This this seems like uh, it seems very real. This uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> this world. Um, yeah, it's just yeah. My note here: uh, the process of taking your human life and putting it into the funnel of existence. That's the that's the life that we all wow. live, <laughs> and that's what this film uh, is about. Um, I've, mm-hmm. I've kind of laid out the this, this it's not like a plot the, the, yeah the, the next step is kind of like um our our dominico he's like he keeps waiting for the girl to come back and because like when mm-hmm. he's waiting in that room there's this tension he keeps looking at the door every time the door opens is that her is that her and then finally like one person comes in but then she comes in right behind him he's like oh yeah, it's her but she doesn't make eye contact with him immediately she kind of like keeps looking around the room in the wrong way in that perfect mm-hmm. way. And then finally, when she's against the other wall, talking to like some other of the girls that were hired and then she finally sees him and she lights up in that right way. And he's like, Oh, Hey, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and then you're like, Oh, cool. We're going to like live together forever in our jobs. And it's all going to be great. Mm-hmm. But no, as soon as they get together, they're split apart and it's like, Oh, well, see you later. Like today. But mm-hmm. no, RJ, that's not how it works in the system. So, <laughs> so he's off. He's a, uh, El, El Posto, he is the uh, the the postal boy. He delivers messages in within the mm-hmm. bureaucracy, which is all middle aged men and women. Some of them crying at their desks. Some of them indifferently looking down at their work in front of them, not wanting to acknowledge this human weakness. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, don't, I started thinking about Agnes Varda's Vagabond, RJ. Okay, it, so because that's a movie that is about bucking the system. And what that might turn out to look like and how difficult it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it's still like, to me, like that movie represents uh, that viewpoint that we don't really see that often in the Criterion Collection. Like we get like variations of it with these like the punk movies, like a Sid and Nancy Jubilee, where it kind of depicts this, like what it is to drop off. But there's also a sense of community or other people that are like mm-hmm. doing it. And there's also, uh, it's not really a choice. It's kind of like where people wind up to a certain degree, it's choice. And then with Vagabond, it felt like this person wanted to drop out. And it's like, why would they want to? But then this movie kind of illustrates why someone might want to do that. Uh, Because this movie doesn't, it doesn't paint the greatest picture of adulthood, especially at Mm -hmm. at a young age where it's like, should this, I don't know, 
15 year old be uh being subjected to this system <laughs> so soon why not i mean what what's he gonna do for anyone in his life you know <laughs> right so <laughs> Uh, as an Italian, you know, neo realist, realist film, the more real it mm-hmm. gets, the more unreal it seems. Like, because mm-hmm. then I don't know. This is like a a trapping of like a lot of 20th century films. These uh, scenes of like hall, like long hallways of offices. We've seen it in like the, the apartment, um, the, mm-hmm. the 160s, uh, the trial with Anthony Perkins. It's the same thing. The this the dehumanizing yeah. thing. It, it's all there, and I think it's still relevant. Because uh, no one even actually seems yeah. to question this stuff anymore. They just kind of go along with it. It's just kind of mm-hmm. like, well, grow up. That's what it is. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But and then get we a get a job, you bum. You get a job. And then we get to like probably uh, one of the highlights of this movie for me that really gets to uh, my letterbox review, kind of talking about the ache. Because not mm-hmm. only does it hit upon all this stuff about society and like mm-hmm. how we how we just have to embrace it because what's the alternative you're poor you can't afford mm-hmm. anything and that's no way to live but like you also have this like romance this budding romance uh in the mind at least of our protagonist where mm-hmm. he, he does see the girl again and they're like oh hey how's it going and then like she's got new friends and she's got guys courting her and it's like oh that's how it yeah. goes she's, she's like a pretty girl oh she's gonna have everybody's attention but then oh, but then they have, they, they have a moment and it's like oh yeah well you know if my parents let me go i'm going to go to uh this uh like staff party later uh for like new mm-hmm. year's eve and uh yeah well maybe we'll hit, we'll see each other and he's like oh yeah great 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 and once again uh this is reminding me kind of of uh Truffaut's antoine and colette uh it's it's some, sure. it's, like, it's the same year black and white Mm -hmm. and you're kind of like oh it's hitting on that same awkwardness and of course uh the the scene when uh dominico arrives and he's like got the (laughs) these flowers and he's like yeah it's gonna be awesome she's gonna be there and it's like nope he's like the third person to arrive to this empty room with like senior citizens Mm -hmm. (laughs) senior citizen couples and a band playing and he walks in. There's no one to talk to. And he goes and sits at a table by himself. And you begin the wait. You mm-hmm. begin the wait. And you start like, I, I got to be cool. And then I'll look over at the door and see every time someone you hear footsteps, I'm going to look over. Is that someone I know? Is that? No. Oh, no. It's not. Oh, and wait. There's a group of people. Oh, I don't know any of them. <laughs> and then the, the the senior citizen couple say, oh, come over here. Don't be stupid. Like, come and sit down with us and, like, bring mm-hmm. that bottle with you. They gave you a bottle because you're a young guy. Yeah, bring that bottle over here. And then now you've got that feeling of missing out because now you're stuck at that table with these people. And you're like, yeah. I feel like a fucking piece of shit kid who's stuck with these old people. I'm not, mm-hmm. this isn't cool. And those people over there, they seem like they're having a good time, but they're probably not. But it looks like they're having a better time because they're having a better time than me. And here I am. I, yeah. picked, I picked the wrong table. It's all those anxieties. It's all those things that are so well observed that I think are mm-hmm. very real. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, it just hits on that, and then they never come, and then someone asks you to dance, and you don't really want to. But there's this, this push of like, maybe just have a good time, just let yourself have a good time, give yourself over to it, just get over it. But mm-hmm. it, but it's not, it doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel good at all. But then so, RJ, one yes. day, someone kills themselves at your job, and you get, <laughs> and then you get their job. Hey, isn't that how you got your job? <laughs> someone, no, actually, no one had to die for no one had to, to no one had to die so but that was they? good they didn't no no i uh okay I, I i did not so anyway okay uh and as my note here goes the crunching wheels of time rolls on over your soul good buddy mm-hmm. uh i mean that's just life right so rj yes what did you think of <clears throat> il posto you're quite a fan of this il posto hey it worked for me. Quite a fan. Yeah. Quite a fan. What's Il Posto mean, Jarrett? <laughs> what does it mean? I don't know. I'm 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 literally asking you. <laughs> I I don't know. I'll let you look that up and you can tell me later. I was curious the whole time, but I was too mm-hmm. lazy to Google it myself. Okay, okay. So I actually went into this movie a little stacked. So because, allegedly uh, Yes. The place. I mean I mean, I mean that, that kind of works. That's actually an awesome title. <laughs> yeah, the place. The place. W- which place? The place. The you place. Know? So I went into this movie a little bit swung because um, 
I saw you hearted this movie and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Jared Duncan doesn't just heart movies left and right. This must be the real deal. Mm. So I went into it and I was like, let me see what's going on in this bad boy. And uh, as the movie progressed, I was like, I can see why Jared's into this because it's kind of loosely a sad bastard film. Yeah, it's like in a sense, it's, it's like not it's not like totally. Yeah, yeah. In in the sense where it's like you feel bad for the dude, not because he's a sad um, bastard. In the okay. sense where it's like he's pathetic, so, but you're just like, oh, poor so guy. Some alternate titles. There's one called yeah. The Sound of Trumpets, uh, but there's one no, just called The Job. Which is like if it's like the post, the posting of a job, I yeah. guess. But it's like the place, the job. So it doesn't really translate super super well. Well, where's our Italian fans with the gabagool that can tell us what's going on here mm-hmm. with this il posto? All right, that's what I want to know. So yeah, go on. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so it's kind of like a sad bastard film, but not in the sense where you're just like, oh, that's a pathetic guy. Mm-hmm. You're just kind of like, oh, I feel bad for this kid. Look at him; he's having a miserable time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like the worst kind of coming of age story. It is in a sense. It's like, uh, I, you are now an adult. That's it. You, yeah. Game over, dude. Even and like, you, you can, you, you haven't even figured out life at all. Have at it. <laughs> Go have a job. Yeah. You see the dread, like they actually do a really good job just showing the dread in this kid because he's always just like unsure. And he's like, you can tell he's like, I don't, I really wish I wasn't here. And they're like, what do you want to do? He's like, I kind of wish I could have stayed in school, but <laughs> You know, I'm here. Well, maybe I'll do some night class. Well, well, there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's just the cog, man, moving at moving at a good clip. Uh, so I'll say Il Posto, Hermano Olmi. Uh, in in this one movie, this dude did more for me than I think all the Truffauts films. Mm-hmm. Like his entire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was his, really. His entire thing. Yeah. I was uh, like other than. Uh, Antoine Collette, which I really did like. Which you uh, really liked. Yes, which I really liked. Uh, I thought this was far more interesting than 400 Blows. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, uh, mm-hmm. the the whole uh, Antoine Donnell cycle. Yes. So uh, I – the Antoine Donnell stuff I thought was fine. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm just not a huge I, – I, I think I, I just don't like Truffaut. I think that's all it is. I just don't like Truffaut that much Um, because all I've seen are the Antoine Donnell movies. And it's like, I don't care about this kid. So you like that Jules and Jim, though. Yeah, Jules and Jim is good. So that that's what I mean. I don't like the Antoine Donnell series because I don't take much out of that. Uh, But El Posto, I was kind of like, is this what people watching 400 Blows feel? Because it's like, then I kind of get it. Like, I, I wasn't blown, like, no dicks were blown off for me watching El Posto. Yeah. But in, in the same sense, I was like, this movie is way more effective than 400 Blows for me. Because I thought this one was very relatable, very real. And it I thought it was a better made movie all around uh, for a bunch of different reasons. So, like, Truffaut's not a bad director or anything like that. But I didn't like the way that he kind of lays out a lot of his stuff. I think El Posto is just mint in the way that they, they present these things. Like one of the big ones that I really like to say the, uh, the guy who kills himself in his job yeah. um, or not even like, even before that, that's the example I'll use. But I like that this movie doesn't treat you like a complete idiot. Uh, and it's like, you'll fucking figure it out. You're watching the movie. You're along for the ride. Do, do some work yourself because it's just like the way that they show that scene or like they tell that story, they show that empty room with like, and it's just this kind of slow pan of all these unused things. And then it cuts to all these people in an office staring at an empty desk. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to uh, the kid getting brought in and you're like, Oh, that fucking guy's dead. Great news. Great news. And now they're getting replaced. And then it, it just met with the anger from all these people. It's like, this piece of shit, kid. Yeah. It's like, he can't even fucking read. It's like, I've been here for 20 years. I deserve that desk. And I was like, I get <laughs> yeah. it. I get all of this. This is that, that office mentality, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it's so very real. I think that part, like the story itself is relatable because it's real. But I, I just like the way that the movie showed it because, because they don't treat you like a piece of shit, Jarrett. They're just like, you'll figure it out. And like, not that it's hard to follow or anything. No. 
I thought it was really easy to follow. And like, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't spell it out for you in the way that say current movies, you, like you watch it, you're like, okay, I know what's going to happen. Or I like, I know what happened. And then there's a 10 minute explanation. It's like, this is why I did this. And you're like, I got it. You're fine. So I thought Il Posto was uh, good in that sense. I think it's just a well-made movie where a lot of the scenes, like they skip the middle, the middle ground because they're like, you don't need that. You'll figure it out. And I did. Mm-hmm. And I'm, and I'm a big dummy. So if I can figure it out, you can figure it out. Uh, but yeah, I, like I just, I like the kid's story because I think it's very real. Uh, I see it all the time. Like in one of my jobs, we employ lots of like 16, 17, 18 year olds. And a lot of them are like, they're there cause they got to have a job. They got to help out their family or, some of them are on their own and they're like, this is my life now. And a lot of them have that same expression. They're just like, I, I'd rather not be here. That downturn but I don't, smile. Yeah. But it's like, I don't really have a choice. And then uh, the one thing that you kind of highlighted and I think is like, it's very, no matter what kind of like what facet you're getting into or like what kind of person you are, where you kind of get down the kids showing up to the party and not knowing where to fit in Mm -hmm. that, that it's like, no matter what you're into, if you like go out with friends to bars, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If you like, say you're not the bar crowd and you're just meeting your friends at a place, say you're meeting at a fucking McDonald's and you show up early and you're just like, what do I do now? And then they're late. And then they're like, where did they go? And then you're like, are they coming? And like, it's, and that's what I mean. No matter what you're into, that's happened to, that's got to have happened to you. Yeah. Unless you are just like the piece of shit who has like, who has like probably a personality disorder of some sort. But I imagine most people have like gone through that process a handful of times at least in their life. Like in, like, even if you say you are that guy, but like, Maybe you got to go somewhere where you have to be in the public setting for any amount of time and you're there and you're just uncomfortable and you're like, I wish I wasn't here. It's it happens. That's how fucking life is. I mean, I am now on the opposite side of that where (laughs) Andy and I are that old couple and I'm like, that kid's got some booze, but he's not drinking it. Hey, kid. Hey, kid. Get over here. And then he comes over and say, hey, wait, bring that bottle. And then you even get the aggressive woman who's like feels left out. She's not aggressive, but you you can like see the despair in her eyes. She's like, I'm the only one not dancing. She's like, I'm gonna take this kid for a ride. And then I'll, like, I'll do oh. him. I'll do him a favor. But he's I'll also do... doing me a favor. Mm-hmm. I also really liked uh, in that whole scene. You have that other like lady that uh, like the married lady whose husband won't dance with her. Yeah. So she's out with like other guys. And it's it's really like it's really elegant in the way that they show that. And I don't use that word very often, Jarrett. Oh, wow. It's fine, <laughs> fine artisanal film craft. But it, it actually is because you see the setup and then it's almost in the periphery where you're watching other people dance. And then those two people kind of pass the frame, like the eye of the, the camera. And you see like how close they are. And you're just like, I get what's going on with this lady. She's probably underappreciated. Her piece of shit husband doesn't want to dance with her. I see what's going on. She's looking for more, dear. Or maybe they're just into that sort of thing. Because that's okay now, too. Then it is curious, too, uh, with the next film that these social dynamics come into play mm-hmm. right off the bat, actually. Mm-hmm. Where it's almost kind of confusing. <laughs> We're like, wait, yeah. what's happening? So uh, I'm on board with El Posto. I think it's very good. Good stuff. So I don't know if you have more to no, really. Um, I mean, trivia, uh, mm-hmm. dire- director Armando Omi, he uh, went on to marry uh, the actress who played Antoinetta. Which one's Antoinetta? Oh, uh, the young? Yeah. Okay. Yes. How old was he at the time? Uh, this was like his first real film. He was doing documentary huh. stuff. I think so she was... he wasn't Polanski old? No. <laughs> I don't Great think it, was... it, it wasn't one of those type of deals. Okay. As far as you I'm gotta, aware. You gotta ask. Yeah. Gotta ask. It was a different yeah. time, 61. Mm-hmm. Next movie. Yes. Uh, the Fiancés, mm-hmm. 1963. What about them? Uh, the synopsis from Letterboxd. It's a brief one. 
A young okay. man has a renewed interest in his girlfriend when he takes a job that separates the two. Wow. <laughs> well, okay. Like, to be, come to on. Be, to be fair. I know. That's actually not the worst we've had. It's, that's kind of accurate. Yeah. It's kind of like, did not watch the first hour of film. <laughs> but figured it out. Figured it out. Yeah. Okay. So... This movie opens up, as I kind of mentioned just a second ago, with a a dance. It's 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 a sure it it's it's very um, I guess dances were a thing still. I don't think they are like this anymore. Like where people actually get together in a communion space, um, maybe at like church functions and stuff like that. This is more of a thing, but I don't know if people mm-hmm. do that now. I never did. Uh, so Andrew's I, grandparents did. Well, there you go. All the time they talk about it. All the time the big the dance the, until the sun comes up. There you go. So it opens up with these two people. They look pretty miserable. And and you're like, sure. why why are these? And you're like, okay, what's this movie about? This movie is about fiancés. I guess this, this is the fiancés. And, uh, well, they don't seem very happy. And they're dancing with other people. There's some passive aggressiveness. You were getting these little flashbacks to... Mm-hmm to happier days, but like not even really, it's not even played up in flashback form. It's very loose, uh, in his presentation of how information is happening. Mm-hmm. And then, and then we kind of move ahead where, um, mm-hmm. our, our protagonist, our, our male lead, he's going off to work. He has quit his job. There's actually a, at this point, there's actually this really, great shot of him at this like giant hangar warehouse where he's like working on sort of this like small like engine I guess and then he moves away from it and he starts walking and then the camera's following him and more and more the scene reveals that he's in this like larger and larger space and then it finally Mm -hmm. pans over and then he's in this absolutely massive massive room with all these people working on different engines you're like oh that's really well done like it's just it's it's so smooth and effortless but it's just like, mm-hmm. that's a really nice shot. So mm-hmm. um, once again, we have a, a social critique going on with the uh, Olmi's filmmaking. This one, though, honestly did not work as well for me. Um, mm-hmm. I agree. And uh, a lot of it is about this guy starting a new job in a town city where they're building this big gigantic plant and Mm -hmm. he's kind of taking like a probably a pay raise to go work uh away from home from his fiance and then you start thinking oh that's why that she's mad and why they're not talking why they're having difficulties because Mm -hmm. he's taking this job and he's leaving her and she's like what are you doing why are you doing this we don't need to do this why are you going but well i gotta make money gotta make a living for us gotta buy that house gotta get spaghetti Mm -hmm. on the table so (laughs) spaghetti spaghetti uh, okay. It's very expensive spaghetti this time. Mm-hmm. So he he's working. He's a like a heavy mechanic, I guess. And, like and, we, and we go through the whole process of him like catching her. Like, does he fly or is he a train? It's like all every single step of the path to this job, to the work site, to the hotel room, making sure he's got a hotel room. But it's only for four days because mm-hmm. the room's not going to be there in four days. So he's got to figure something else out. And he's just kind of going through the motions, being polite and like, yep, yep, yep. I'm just along for the ride. Mm-hmm. And he checks in. And there's all these like, there's like moments that are like, that stick with me, particularly this one where uh, you see the like communal TV room where like, because this is yeah. 1963. Not every single room has a television at this point. You have to go to the TV viewing room and there's just like mm-hmm. row upon row of recliners and there's just men all sitting in these recliners. And I'm like, God, what would it smell like in there? Like all these like <laughs> men just like sitting Probably around. Probably like my house after, right now. After eating, uh, just one mm-hmm. man's passed right out as the, <laughs> as the TV plays off. I guess there was the scene kind of right before that too, I think, where uh, he orders food. And, uh, yeah. and then like the waiter, he's just like pissed that this guy's showing up at the end of serving. And he's just mm-hmm. like, what do you want? Like, all I've got is like, all I got is spaghetti. Is that fine? <laughs> That's great. And he's really just like bristles at this. And then he comes back and he starts like, not like kind of explaining why he has no patience for him. And he just lays he's out like this, like on him. he's venting on him. 
But like, she's like, yeah, he's not even, he's not even saying sorry. He's just like, yeah, this is my life right now. I've got a kid who's like three months old. They don't know what's wrong with them. The doctor's doing this. I, I have to go home. I'm going to go home. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to wake up. And my day starts all over again. And again, it's just like, oh, that sounds really horrible. But at the same time, it's like, everyone's life's horrible. And like, there's no solving yep. anything. Everything sucks. Yep. It's again, it's there's, true. There's a lot of uh, things rolling over of all me. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, like, the first hour is kind of him dealing with the loneliness of being on the road, I guess, mm-hmm. and being at this job. And it kind of runs, it gets to the point where like in the last 15 minutes, it kind of gets to like the, uh, the love story, I guess the, the mm-hmm. big, like with an exchange of letters going back and forth between the two of them that kind of mm-hmm. justifies this, like kind of like, empty hour of the, the job. And I don't know if it's like a smart move to like maybe risk losing your audience in like the depiction of essentially working at a work site that is so far from your house. You don't know anybody. Mm-hmm. You just go, you go out, you eat, you drink. Um, you might go out on the town. You might go to a party. You might go to a festival and it's like a rigor, but you, you might lose track of people. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's uh, in that sense, it's very relatable for our uh, neck of the woods. Mm-hmm. But I'm pretty sure, like, every part of the world has this line of work where mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's the type of work. It, it pays well for what it is. But then we have a scene where a guy's explaining, yeah, it's all great, but the town, it adapts to you. And then they wind up mm-hmm. charging more and more for stuff because they want a cut of what you're making. So by the end of it, you take home nothing. You might as well just stayed where you were in the first place. So, again, the uh, <laughs> the hopelessness of uh, the vision of... Uh, Ole Miss world and maybe the world itself. Uh, in fact, it actually is like maybe. this. Uh, it's all mm-hmm. there. Uh, I, one thing too, like that opening scene with the the dancing and whatnot. It actually it reminded me of uh, Milos Forman's Loves of a Blonde, which also opens up with that yeah. whole exchange yeah. too. Yeah, there, there's a lot of these like little touch, like these references, I guess, uh, or people are just kind of thinking about the same things. And uh, it's interesting looking back at movies from you know decades ago and seeing what those social points are. And I mean, mm-hmm. maybe it's hard for us to watch movies now to see what those social points are. They're, they're obvious things when people 50 years from now will watch movies and be like, Oh, Hey, it's another scene where they're in this like type of club that does not exist anymore. Or this sort of a uh, social space. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I've, I've never been dated by context. Uh, like <laughs> I've always been just able to immerse myself completely, no matter what the, political historical social context of the time is ah. so like i mean french 60s cinema italian 60s cinema i'm completely like i i get it man mm-hmm. it's never been an issue for me, i i, so. I see well you are uh, yeah. an exceptional man i i know i know uh i mean i don't i don't like to say but uh, you know people tell me frequently that i'm uh, i'm probably the best so yeah. what i'm getting at is mm-hmm. This movie definitely did not work for me as well. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. It's not like it's badly made. No. I just don't – I didn't gravitate toward this material the same way. Um, yeah. It didn't feel – I didn't feel the struggle as much. It seemed like he's an – this is like a grown man now who's mm-hmm. like, I'm going to work. And he seems fine with it. He doesn't seem to be – like he doesn't have that long, sad, bastard face – that uh, Dominico had. Uh, I've seen some people kind of like say he looks like Buster Keaton. I think that's because of the hat, the, the, the straw, the flat straw hat that he's got. But I I mean, I guess, yeah, it's not really, but like, there's a little bit, he he moated really well. He seemed like he had that blank, sad kid face where this guy's like, this is kind of like, he's got that Jack Palance-ness to him. So it's Mm -hmm. like, no, this, this is a man. He knows what he's doing. So he's less, slightly less sympathetic. And I found that like his, his fiance, the, the female, protagonist she really doesn't get that much attention i mean what how how long is she even in this movie for like 20 minutes yeah she, she's in flashbacks because there's times where he's like when he's out and about where he thinks about it and he thinks about mm-hmm. the the past and their good times which makes sense mm-hmm. that's how human life goes you think about sure. you think sure. about people you love and the kind of fill in the gaps and you're like man i'd rather be doing that than this right now mm-hmm. so i mean yeah like again it's just kind of especially after uh, how much I really liked Il Posto. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was just like, oh, not not a, just a, a just big old shit. No, it just didn't. It didn't get me. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, so I, I'm on board with you. Like, even so, I didn't love uh, uh, El Posto as much as you. I thought it was a good movie. I liked it. Um, and then when I put this thing on, I was kind of just like, I don't know, all the good ways that El Posto skipped those middle points that you don't need. Mm-hmm. This thing was like, we're going to skip not just the middle point, but also the start and sometimes the end. Mm-hmm. It's like, we're just going to give you random stuff here. You'll figure it out. So it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of funny the way that El Posto is a perfect example of where you can make cuts to stuff. And then, uh, what is this in, uh, I Fidanzanti, uh, <laughs> this bad boy kind of does the opposite where like, not that I was confused ever, but I was just kind of like, I think they need to fill in a few things here because we're missing some stuff. There's not enough we're, to hang your hat on. Yeah, exactly. We're missing a few things here. So there was that. And then, yeah, I don't know. Like the story itself isn't as interesting. And I think the biggest problem to it, like the big, the biggest flaw to this movie is it just, it cuts out a lot of that stuff that I think would make it stronger. Like if they showed more of certain things, more of their relationship it would make a better movie but all you get is this dude like playing hijinks with uh, all these different apartment people and yeah. like that's fine but yeah. what, what are we what are we after then you know mm-hmm. that's what kind of, that's kind of what i was going for you know sure <laughs> you know yeah yeah no it's just definitely uh a lot less engaging <laughs> Yeah, and something I would lesser film. Yeah, well, the posto. It's like I wholeheartedly recommend people watch it. And fiancés, mm-hmm. nah, you you're you're fine. It's just where yeah. you're at. Just yeah, honestly, you should watch El Posto. And uh, I Fidencio, you you're fine without. Yeah. Even if you like El Posto, you're fine just watching that one. That's yeah. it, for sure. Mm-hmm. Want to hear about who hates <laughs> these films? Uh, I mean. Has anyone ever watched these movies? Uh, you know? More than, more than, more than you uh, think, more than others. Okay. So uh, we got I got two here for uh, Il Posto. Okay. So number one, Scott Davis with one okay. and a half stars. Whoo, baby. Yeah. Kim, there's some opinions. I've never really been a mm. big fan of Italian neorealism. And this film is no exception. It's quite probably the slowest film I've ever seen. Almost nothing ever happens in it, and I can't tell you I've derived much meaning from it other than a general morose message. It's got a few nice scenes, but in general, I was just waiting for this movie to end while it dragged on and on and on. And the movie is actually only like 90 minutes long. Uh... Yeah, I don't really feel like this drags. You know what um, Scott Davis also gave one and a half stars to? Hmm. The Big Lebowski. Wow. And, uh, I mean, other films, but they did give Call Me By Your Name five stars. Oh, good. Good. And they gave The Shape of Water five stars. There you go. And eighth grade five stars. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you want to hear their super? I mean, I don't want to be mean, but their bio is uh, I'm just here to have a good time and read some movies, y'all. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Don Vito Corleone. Oh, of all the gin joints in oh, all the towns stop. in all the world, no. she walks into mine. Rick oh. Blaine. Oh. And then here's the here's one for the irony crowd, Jarrett. Trust the Fungus Mario by Luigi Mario. It's like, uh, well, I see what he did there. You see what he did there? He was he was baiting you a little bit. Yeah, but then he also just makes me think of Ricky Gervais's characters. Yes, yeah. a little bit. A little bit. A, like, a, little, a, bit. a little David Brentish there. A little bit. A little bit, a little bit. yeah. Uh, the second one, Julian Towers, two oh, and boy. a half stars. Okay. This is a lengthy one. Not oh. particularly sympathetic to the politics here, which I found rather naggingly naive. Only okay. an artist blinded by the privilege of a self-dictating career structure could raise moral alarm that, shocker, most jobs are dispiriting, dehumanizing, and a waste of life. Grow up. That's the modern world, bub. And I say that as someone who just spent eight hours at his internship fixing somebody else's Excel spreadsheet. 
<laughs> Kayla, so this dude's problems are a little bit to his own, you know, because it's like, yeah, everyone's got a bad time, which I agree with. Everyone does have a bad time, but I'm the opposite. It's like, but, well, so why don't we I, all give I, up? I believe, uh, yeah, you know, his profile, there's the mention of uh, Brown University. Maybe I'm biased wow. having seen Olmi's later and quite good, The Tree of Wooden Clogs. But watching this, I couldn't get that film's glorification of commune living out of my head. Certainly, it would be nice to turn back the clock and each pull our equal share. But that's a fantasy fairy dream. And mm-hmm. advocating for it is a waste of your socio-political energy. I do not know uh, move to a kibbutz or what something. What? <laughs> I don't know. Move to a kibbutz or something. Anywho. What are you talking about, dude? Uh, not to suggest I wrote this off on pure ideology and somehow ignored whatever filmic genius was cradling it. Had El Posto directed its attention towards crafting a truly distinct protagonist and zeroed in on his realization that his life was essentially over, like everyone says it does, I surely would have loved it. But Olmi has almost no interest in Dominico beyond his wounded, archetypical face. When you make a lead character a stand-in for some eternal human element, it only makes them seem less human. And that runs against the thesis Mm -hmm. here in ways I can't overlook. I mean, you can. <laughs> I can't. Julian, I, you can't? Tell me about Jules. Well, his bio. If you're just reading this, you missed the offensive bio area. We are now in the flower area era. Love and understanding for all. I would be honored if you were to join me, Jarrett. One of their favorite movies is one of mine, Vanilla Sky. Pretty good. Both of these people who hated this movie didn't like High Life, that new Robert Pattinson movie. Which I haven't seen, but I'm just noticing the trends. You know what I mean, Jer? Just picking up on some trends. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, they don't really have anything that stands out. All their favorite movies are just run-of-the-mill Criterion movies, and there's nothing, like, shocking. They don't have a ton. Like, five-star movies, they only have 34, and it's what you would expect. And half-star movies, they only have three, so... (laughs) They're dumb. Is that what you want to hear? <laughs> Finally, uh, for the fiancés, I got yeah. a two and a half star review from Luke Robinson. Okay. It is fitting, I guess, for a film about a homeless migrant worker to feel ungrounded and unbound, to float free of geography and chronology in an almost confusingly structuralist series of sketches, some comedic, some achingly sad. For me, Mm. though, the mercurial nature of the movie meant that I never really felt or followed the main storyline of Love's Lost and Longed For. They became sublimated into the routine, another task to tick off rather than sublime moments of release that some other reviewers described feeling. The new wave style scattershot bursts at the climax played more like fantasies or the memories of fantasies Mm. once held, the life of a romance flashing before its eyes as it dies. I guess my reading of the film, and perhaps of life, is that absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. Absence simply makes you absent. Wow. Wow. Poetic, my man. Poetic. It's not too bad. Uh, it's not too bad. No, it's not too bad. I When I was looking at his five-star films, I was like, this is fine. Uh, this guy and the last uh, person both gave The Apartment five stars, which I'm really on board with. This person's not not bad. But, I mean, I, I'm just digging into their one-star reviews, and there's some weird things here, Jer. The Witch one-star. The Vavitch. Yep. Sorry. Uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer one-star. Hey, Jared, do you like The Witch Finder General? I do. This guy gave it one star. Wow. What do you, what, what do you feel about that, Jer? I'm, cu- I'm curious what the uh, arguments for these as being one stars are. They also gave Sleepaway Camp one star. Madness. Disgusting. Madness. And then they gave uh, that hit remake of the Mel Gibson hit movie, What Women Want, What Men Want. They gave it a half star, <laughs> which uh, I think I've mentioned before a week or two ago. Andy said, it's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. There you have it, folks. Mm-hmm. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, and neither is El Posto. No, it's not bad. <laughs> That's it. Excellent. Yep. Well, I'm sure that many of you have been listening to this at your desk in your sure. office where someone might have killed themselves so the position would mm-hmm. open up. And now you get to listen to us, you know, I don't know. It's like 
a balm <laughs> for your for your aching, burning soul, the mm-hmm. the wound just <laughs> weeping out. Mm-hmm. Its essences, and here we are. Which essence for you? All the all of those essences, all the humors, your four humors inside your body. Oh no! Oh, leech. Get some leeches for that. Yeah, I mean they fix you. Yes. Up. Okay. After the break. Yes. RJ and I kill ourselves, and then we're replaced by it's not you. Don't tempt me with a good time. <laughs> 